Ed Keebler, Ed from Rottler, hearing Doug Yates talk about you saved his dad a lot of time. <laughs> like, in, and as someone who I think about my dad, like doing something six hours and then it takes 45 minutes. That's what you're trying to do for everybody. That's correct. That's, uh, that's one of our goals at Rottler. It's the only business that we're in is the automotive engineering building business or the performance business. So we're constantly trying to innovate and make our product better, more efficient, and, and allow the shop owner, as, as we talked earlier with Joe Creason, you know, is, is it's all about what I call billable hours. So if a two-man shop can bill as many hours as a three- or a four-man shop can, there's going to be better profit for them, hopefully. And, and so that's our goal is, is to try to make this equipment more user-friendly, uh, even though it's higher in higher technology, it's user friendly and create better productivity in the shop. And, and Doug just said it and it's, it's all a competition. I mean, we're all friends. We all try to improve, but it's all a competition. These people that are in business, there are other businesses. They're trying to get ahead and any innovation. And in the back in the day, they would look for innovation in all these different places. Any innovation that could help them get ahead, they would adopt. And that is the same. That is that is true for what you do. That's what you're helping shops do: innovate, get ahead, create more time. Absolutely. You know, if the shop is more productive and makes more money, they're going to buy more equipment. And and that's our end goal. Is is you know our uh, our customers are partners, and and we try very hard bring a quality product to them that gives them or allows them more productivity and, and to make more money. And the idea that there are machines around the country and around the world, frankly, operating, and, and he said it, lights out 24 seven, making parts and pieces for many different industries. There's gotta be a sense of pride in that too. Like as you watch the whole world evolve, knowing that you guys are a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. and and. Unfortunately, I'm going to date myself here, but I've been in this. I've been in the automotive industry for 47 years now, so I've seen innovations that I never dreamed possible. You know, uh, uh, Doug talked about uh, he honed his first motor at 13 years old. Well, I probably didn't hone my first block until about 18. But I, I look at today to where you have a, a, a piece of equipment that you can push a button and walk away and it will hone all eight cylinders within a couple of tenths to the exact surface finishes you need unattended while somebody's doing something else. I would have never dreamt that possible. What, which is amazing. And, and, and I wanted to ask Doug, but he kind of touched on it. And so I'll throw it out there to you. To get to where we are now is amazing. Like you, you said, I would have never dreamed, right? But someone has to dream. And it's obvious that thinking to the future is part of this business. And so what do you see out there 20 years from now? Well, that's a that's an excellent question. I won't be around in another 20 years probably. Oh, but, that's but, not uh, true. Uh, you know, our big, what, what I tell everyone is, is I, I travel across the country throughout the year and it is so important to get your customers involved with your company. And, and one of the big reasons I travel around the country and, and visit customers is, is to get their input and find out where their challengers are at. If we, can, if we can meet their challenges, then we're a successful company. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Clearly a successful company. And we're just getting started. This thing is going off pretty well. We've got a worldwide audience. They're participating. They're sending in questions. They're chatting with each other. They're all becoming friends in the chat room. Like, uh, did you expect that it would happen like that? No, I didn't. When, when we undertook this endeavor, uh, you know, it was, it was just almost on a whim. It's like, we don't have a trade show. What are we going to do? Let's try this virtual thing. And, and thank goodness that, that we were lucky enough to, to uh, get guys like Lake Speed and Chris Straub and, and, and the, the Joe Creasons and, and Randy Neal at CWT and all of these people to help us because without their help, this would have never happened. Well, that it, it's tremendous. And again, we are just getting started. Keep on rolling with your questions in the chat section. We definitely appreciate that as much interaction as is possible. As you know, that's part of the trade show deal is the interaction with people. Absolutely. And uh, we've been talking a lot about cylinders and honing and surface finish considerations. So why not have a look at one of our videos where we go a little more in depth in this area. So you've been hearing about it. Now check it out.
Hey everybody, I'm Ben Strader here from uh, EFI University and thanks for being at this part of the Engine Performance Expo. I'm here with a couple of buddies of mine. I got Ed Keebler from uh, Rottler and I got Keith Jones from Total Seal Piston Rings and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about the surface finish that you want to have uh, depending on a number of variables in your high performance and racing engine. There's a lot of things that happen that will uh, affect what you actually want that cylinder to look like. So Keith is kind of the resident expert in the uh, what we want. And uh, and then Ed and I will pitch in and talk about how we might get that. But Keith, tell us a little bit about why the surface finish is actually important. Why does it matter? Well, it, it, it's the gasket, it's the seal. And we're gonna take a pause on that because somebody did <laughs> mute their cell phone. Uh, it was Ed, yeah. so no big deal. We'll keep rolling on because this is good stuff. What's changed over the years, I mean, we're all dealing with engines, we're all honing, we're trying to, you know, we're using the hone to get the cylinder to a certain size. We're trying to achieve good bore geometry, we want a true straight round cylinder, but we also want to get a cylinder finish. And the whole point of that cylinder finish is to retain oil. As, as Lake Speed, who's behind the camera right now, so eloquently said, the oil is the gasket. This is the seal. The rings don't ride on the bore. They ride on the oil that's retained by the bore. This is the critical part of achieving good ring seal. We as a ring manufacturer strive to produce the best possible part we can within all the means and technology that we have. But the ring is part of a system. Cylinder finish, piston, ring groove, wall, proper tuning, all of these things are part of that soup. They're part of that mix. And if we don't get the recipe right in that soup, we are not going to achieve the ring seal that we need. The ring can only do so much. I mean, face it, folks, it's just a piston ring. If we make it flat, it's round, it's light, tight, what more can I ask it to do? It's doing its job. It can't fix a screwed up bore finish. It can't fix a bad piston. It can't fix a bad tune-up. We, as I like to say, and I haven't said it in a while, we are the red-headed stepchild of the racing engine. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say racing, any engine for that matter. You know, going down the road, flat tire, must have been a piston ring. Ram one over. Yeah, it's yeah. always the ring. So with that said, getting these surface finishes correct are going to help to assure that that part of the mix is there for the ring. And and what's changed so much over the years is the cylinder material. We, we generally look to as cylinders and measure them in Brunel hardness. We've got, we'll say the old days of a typical small block Chevy, small block Ford. You're looking at Brunel numbers, 150, 160, relatively soft stuff. We were dealing with piston rings, 564s, 564s, 316s. I mean, you have compression rings that make between five and seven pounds of force per ring. I mean, folks, we've got oil rings that are lighter than that. Today. Yeah, for sure. The oil rings back in those days were in the 20s, 22, 24, 25, hugely high tension rings. So with that said, we'd go in, we'd hit it with a 220 or a 280. We didn't care about the finishes because guess what? The block soft. The rings have got a mountain of tension. Rings have fixed the finish. So Keith, would you say that that's why in the old days it was a huge endeavor to try to get an engine that would last, say, 100,000 miles? Like they were pretty much worn out back then by the time you got there. Oh, oh yeah. Now we have way better materials technology in the block. The rings have less tension, but we're still getting the oil control and cylinder sealing done. So do you think that's one of the major contributing factors to why our engines last longer now? Absolutely. We're, we're dealing with much harder cylinder surfaces. We're dealing with production engines today that have got block hardnesses well into the 200s. We're dealing with race applications that have got cylinder hardness numbers in the 300s, sometimes into the 500s. Very, very hard cylinder materials, which do make it a little bit more difficult to achieve the finishes, but we'll touch on that here in just a moment. But the, the overall material technology, ring-based materials, the coating technologies, the oil technologies. All of these have advanced so far that we're now, I mean, it, it's disappointing if you only get 250,000 miles out of one. And that's on one oil change. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, so what is it that's so critical then about the texture of the surface and why is it, why, why wouldn't I just want the same surface if, the, if some is good, more is better? You know, I mean, if I got 10 different engines, I want to try and get them all to the same surface finish, or are they all unique and individual? So let's talk a little bit about why that surface finish matters and why it changes based on my needs. Absolutely. When we're looking at surface finish, we're talking about measured numbers. We're talking about RPK, which is the peak roughness. This is what the ring actually will come into contact with on a cold start. We've got the RK. This is the roughness below the peak or the mean center line. This is basically your bearing surface. This is what is supporting the load. 
The ring is trying to push its way through the oil film. The pressures behind the ring are trying to punch that ring through the oil film, just like a bearing on a crankshaft. If we don't have enough volume, we don't have enough pressure on that area, the bearing is going to push its way through the oil film and go metal to metal. The same thing happens with the ring. The valley, the RVK, the area below the mean center line, this is your oil trough. This is what holds the oil. This is what I like to call the tooth or the rung on the ladder. It's what gives the oil the ability to cling to the wall and hang on to it. Just because we're throwing the oil up there doesn't mean it stays there. The rings are trying to do everything they can to put that oil back down into the sump. It's this mechanism, these measurements, that are going to leave the proper volume of oil on the board. So now, Keith, I'll interrupt you. You said oh, yeah. these are measured numbers. So are we talking about stuff they do like NASA at the International Space Station, or can like an average everyday guy measure these numbers? Absolutely. We use a tool to measure these called a profilometer. And Lake just happens to have one. We just happen to have one. Thank you, Lake. <laughs> let's, let's see if Lake's good. And it's even charged up. Unbelievable. So what we can do with this is come in, simply run it over the surface. You're going to laugh, folks. We're going to hit it right now. We're going to measure the whiteboard. Here's the profilometer. It's running that surface. So what's hard to see is that little needle, looks like a little record player needle, is actually uh, dragging across the surface of the whiteboard right now. And as there's little ridges and peaks and valleys, it falls in there, you know, like a, one of those things that measures the, uh, the strength of an earthquake, right? Absolutely. And you get all done and you'll have measured numbers. Now and you have data. We have measured data. And as you can see, Ben's whiteboard has got an RA of a 25, and we'll explain that in a little bit. It's got a peak roughness of a 17, not too bad. It's got a core roughness of an 84, but it's only got a valley roughness of a 29. Oops. So uh, this thing's not holding any oil. It's almost like I hunted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so th this one's kind of pathetic, but you know, trust me, we've seen worse. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. We have absolutely seen so, worse. So where's the guy? What is that thing worth? Where does the guy actually get one? Is that something an average shop guy could have, should have? Yeah, this is a Minitoyo SJ210. There's a lot of profilometers out there, folks. There's Federals, there's Mars, there's Zeiss. I, can, you know, I can run a list as long as my leg. These things range in prices from about $500 to well over $100,000, depending on what you want it to do. So what level are you racing at? It all depends on where you're at. You want to get into 3D metrology and look at some of this stuff, you've got to have an optical profilometer. Uh, we're, we're talking really big numbers, but man, there is some sweet data that comes from one of those. But one of these can typically be had for in and around the $2,000, $2,200 range. Uh, not to be a commercial, we do sell these at Total Steel. We set them up. They're ready to go when they go out the door. So you literally just need to hook it up, use it, and run it. And this is available to anybody from the novice to the expert builder. And now we've taken the guesswork out of this. We know what the numbers need to be. We're very good at it. You know, we'll help you and get you a few suggestions of where you need to be based on the application. But... This is one more thing that's no longer being guessed at. I like to say that I port one of the prettiest cylinder heads you've ever seen. Till that tool called the flow bench proves me wrong. <laughs> that's right. It may look great, but you want to knock 20, 30 horsepower out of your jump? You put some of my heads on because they don't work, <laughs> but they look beautiful. The point is, when we're honing cylinders, you can have an absolutely gorgeous looking cylinder. But we're, we're talking microns here, to people. We're talking micro inches. These are very, very small cuts. Five tenths, two tenths, six tenths. It's very easy to create a good looking cylinder. You've got the scratches, they're there, but are they the right scratches? Do we have a deep valley? Do we have a relatively low peak so it's not hard on the ring when you first fire it up? As we saw here, this, not a good cylinder finish. Maybe great for a whiteboard, but certainly a bad cylinder finish. So in your job at every day at Total Sale, how often do you get a you know, phone call from a guy that says, man, I don't know what happened, I bought these new rings, I took my uh, engine block to XYZ machine shop, and they just did it the same way they've always done it, and they told me they've been doing it this way for 30 years, never had any problems. All of a sudden, I put these new rings in, and you know it's got very low time on it, the rings are all burned up. What's wrong with your rings? I get that call daily, <laughs> multiple times, and it's simply, you know, again, we're back to that redhead stepchild thing, and we're talking about, you know, I've got this problem, and it's, it's perceived as a ring problem. And I don't want to say every time, but most of the time, it's a cylinder problem. They just simply didn't get the finished numbers that are required for their application. Uh, we can guide you down those paths, but some basic numbers for what I'll call 90% of what's out there. Your street car, bracket car, circle track car, mild vacuum, mild boost, mild turbo. You're talking RPK numbers, your peak roughness numbers in the middle teens, 14, 15, 
and give or take a little bit, it's a window. RK numbers, your core roughness numbers, you want to be somewhere, let's call that in the 40s, 35 to 45, kind of a window, little here, little there, not really going to hurt you. RVK, your valley depth, you want to be somewhere 40s, 50s, call it 40 to 55, it's a window. We want to be in that right area with the right proportions. We want to try to get the RK about 10 points below the VK. That just helps everything come in faster. When we achieve proper cylinder finish, uh, one of the calls I'll get outside of the guy having the problem is, man, I'm on the dyno. I'm on my 18th hit. She's really coming in now, man. The vacuum numbers are coming up. My blow dye numbers are coming down. That tells me everything about it. Cylinder finish is off by a mile and or he may have put a very, very slippery oil in there because during the breaking process, we need some friction. The rings are the final honing step. They are as good as we can get it on the best machines with the best tools, with the best operators. The rings still do the final job. So the closer I can get it to here, the faster it's going to come in. As Ben can testify, you know, this man lives on the dyno. <laughs> Two, three hits, you're in. This All is right. it. If it's not... If we start an engine up these days and it's more than a couple of runs and it's not settled down, then we know something's wrong with it. And, you know, that's from a lot of some trial and error, but a lot of like calling you guys. And, and, and this is kind of what I was getting at is going, well, what are my targets? You know, where do I want to be with the finish? Because the reason that we kind of got into this whole honing game, um, you know, we have a engine program here where we do true R&D and then we use part of that for our training curriculum. But what I was running into was I would go to the machine shop and I'd get my blocks back and I'd go, they're not, it's not working. It's not right. And the machine shop guy would say, well, I've been doing it this way 30 years and nobody complained. And I would say, did any of those guys measure? Because if you don't measure, you got nothing to complain about. Right. And so what happened was all of a sudden I was seeing this huge inconsistency. It started with our performance and it went back to, well, it's inconsistency in the cylinder finish. And it went to, well, how do I know? How do I measure? So when you get to the level of your shop where you're building enough engines that you're spending and you're investing in tools and technology, I mean, a two thousand dollar tool is not the end of the world to be able to know. I mean, what's the what's the cost just administratively and the headache of having to deal with a mad customer or fix their problem or whatever because the cylinder surface wasn't right? But one of the things I think you guys are always fighting, and Ed, you'll probably share a lot of this in your presentation on how to get what we want. Because right now we're talking about what do I want? Right. I didn't know I was supposed to want anything. Now that I want it, how do I get it? But what happens is the old kind of traditional machine shops that have been around, they're using vitrified stones with X amount of pressure for X number of strokes. But if I do that, I mean, if I'm just taking my stone and lapping a piece of material, if that material is harder or softer, that's not going to produce the same finish every time. And so that's how we ended up into the whole like diamond CNC honing game and talking to you guys about rings. And I mean, I don't know how many sets of rings we've gone through on you know, four engines in the last five years dealing with you, but it's a bunch. It some I tore up and some I was just done with and some actually worked out really good. But my point is that if you're not measuring this stuff, having a conversation about what it should look like is almost irrelevant. It's Would irrelevant. you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so I think what you're getting to is here's, the, here's what these numbers mean. This is what peak is. This is core. This is valley. Now that we're starting to understand that, um, and I'm sure you'll go on, but we want to start looking at, well, okay, now that I know what the difference between a peak and a valley is, what do I want them to be? So you've got a 95% rule, you know, be the teens here, be the 20s and 30s here, 40s and 50s there. That works for a lot of guys. But what about the guys that that doesn't work for? So what are some factors you use to talk about, like, okay, you're going to need, say, more valley or more peak. Talk a little bit about those situations. Absolutely. One of the conversations we like to have at Total Seal, and we're one of those companies that welcomes your phone call. We're not going to try to just you know blow you off. We want to talk to you. And the, and the first thing I ask literally every customer, what are you doing? What is this application? What do you expect out of this engine? Okay, is it a 0 0.7, 0 0.72 millimeter competition eliminator engine with 20 inches of vacuum? Or is this twin turbo LS making 2,000 horsepower on E85? Yeah. We have to fine tune that cylinder finish based on application. So if I know that I've got a, a, an engine that's running copious amounts of fuel through it, very high temperature, more than likely very easily washing out the cylinder and killing the oil film, I'm going to ask for that valley number to go up. I need more oil trapping. As I get into those fuels where we're just really you know, big diesels, where we're just literally standing on top of it, dumping fuel through it. The rolling coal. With rolling coal, yeah. we have got to go with 
very high RBK numbers. As mentioned in one of our previous uh, conversations, I have one customer that has spent tens of thousands of dollars on different ring materials, different coating technologies, nothing fixed it. Scuffing, blow by, pan pressure problems. But as that valley started going up and up and up, the numbers kept getting better and better. We had to get his RBK numbers into the 150s on his engine, but we went from measuring crankcase pressure in, we'll say, double digit pounds to 0.68 pounds at 4,500 horsepower in a six cylinder diesel. But it was all that valley retention because of the massive amount of fuel that's going through this engine. Now we go the other direction, and we know we've got a very light tension package, not pouring fuel through it. We've got really good handle on the tune-up, which is very oversimplified statement. Uh, that's a, there's a lot of things that come into that tune-up. We can possibly reduce that valley number. We know it's going to be a short-term engine. It may only run 20, 30 runs. We've got to look at that window of life. How long do we know that that engine's got to last in that specific environment? But the so, basic numbers that we talk about really don't change that much. The big one, and I know Ed's going to spend a lot of time on this, is how do we get that number on a block that's 150 Brunel versus a block or a sleeve that's 300? This is the challenge yeah. for the engine builder today. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the fuel that's going into the cylinder, some of that liquid fuel is going on the cylinder wall, and it's diluting the oil that's trying to do its job. So if you think about the difference between, say, like a methanol-powered car, which is two, sometimes three times as much fuel as the same thing that would have with, say, gasoline, the amount of oil dilution I'm going to have is way worse. So my valley helps me basically offset that by starting with a bigger pool of oil, yep. right? Excellent amount. So we got to think about at the beginning of the conversation, what exactly are you going to be doing here? What kind of fuel? What kind of racing? You know, think about, is this, a, say, a tractor pull where they might be full throttle for 30 seconds or, uh, you know, a drag strip that only does eighth mile where they're doing four and a half seconds, you know? So all those factors play into how deep you're going to want that valley. Absolutely. And, it, that, and that's perfectly stated because everything is so application oriented. We get asked these questions all the time and there is no cookie cutter answer. There is no, it's this or this. We have to look at the specifics of what it is. What's the block? What's the ring? And most importantly, what are you doing with it? Yeah. Is this an offshore boat that's got to go out and expect to run a thousand hours between builds at 80, 85% load all the time? I mean, this thing's on the carpet. If it's on the water, it's on the mat. Yeah. This is how it runs. So we have to look at each one of those environments. There is no one size fits all program. We have to get into that detail. And All right, Keith, so here's something for you. So, you know, for years and years, we talked about how the old machine shops would always say, like, oh, we've been doing it this way forever, blah, blah, blah. And uh, one of the things I always remember, everybody talking about RA, right? Like the average surface roughness and all that. But we've kind of come to learn that that doesn't really work for something like trying to get good ring seal and have a good, you know, we talk about the gasket and talk about that lubrication layer. So when you're talking about peaks and cores and valleys and talking about, you use the term measured numbers, right? So what's the difference between that and somebody that wants to talk about just average, just RA? Why, why can't I just use RA? Well, the, the problem with RA is we're not looking at the ability of what the surface is as far as peak core value. We're averaging all the numbers together. You can have a great RA and have an absolutely horrible cylinder finish. What we're looking at here is we're dealing with a sliding surface. So we have to break those numbers down. RA does not work when we're looking at sliding surfaces. This is great for a stationary surface, let's say cylinder head gasket. And even there, those guys are starting to get away from RA looking at RZ, which is peak to valley height or the tooth to seal that gasket. So as Ben's got up here right now, Ben, if you want to kind of explain, yeah. you know, expand on that. So when we talk about yeah. RA, we talk about roughness average, right? Mm -hmm. When I look at the shapes of these two surfaces, right? Take the RA part out and go, okay, that's one surface. And then here's another surface. Well, even though they have the same average, they're wildly different in their ability to contain oil and keep that friction surface, that sliding ring that's going across, where think about it, these would all be filled like reservoirs full of oil. All these are going to want to do is chew up that surface that's rubbing across them, even though they have the same RA. So the actual mechanical uh, job that's being done there, this one's going to have a terrible ring seal. This one might be somewhat better, but neither of them really give we, us what we want is that kind of that ratio between my peak and my core and my valley that needs to happen based on the application. So back when everybody just talked about RA numbers, we also had, like we talked about, everybody's using this stone grit 
And I mean, there's probably everybody say, oh, use this stone, fill size, then you do how many swipes of this one. And yep. it was like the, the rubber stamp formula, you know. And that worked because we didn't have as many variables. But now we have all these variables. The blocks are harder. Some blocks are harder than others. Your uh, stone choices range from vitrified stones to diamonds to various levels of that. And then you got CVN cutters now. So what's happened is as we got more variables, the process and the measured values got more specific. And that's where you guys come in. Like, I feel like somebody might be watching what we're talking about and feeling a little intimidated. Well, geez, now I got to buy this $2,000 tool and I don't even know how to turn it on. And even if I did, I don't even know what numbers I'm looking for. But isn't that really what your job is? I mean, you're helping people every day. You know, here's the numbers you should be looking for. If you don't have this tool, that's okay. Form this relationship with your machinist and make sure that he does and he knows what to look for, right? So absolutely. So how often do you get guys that have are, are buying rings or or complaining about ring problems and have no idea about some of these measurements? Is that a normal thing or is that Oh that that's the lion's share. Okay. The, the bulk of the people that I deal with when we start talking about these numbers don't really have a good understanding of what these numbers are or what they mean. So we spend a lot of time with them trying to explain to what these numbers are. And if if I had to put a number on it, and this is, you know, I'm I'm sure not even close to accurate. Out of a hundred machine shops, one or two have a profilometer. The rest are just using the fingernail. And they're, 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 they're using their eyes, they're yeah. using their fingernail, uh, or they have a profilometer. This is the one that I love the most, and they don't use it. Ouch. It's in the drawer, it's in the box. Yeah, we've got one of those, it hasn't been turned on in five years. I think it needs a new battery. Right. Well, uh, <laughs> we forgot how it even works. So if you've got that tool, that's a tool that can be used on every piece. And, and one of the things that you just touched on, and I know Ed has seen this many times, within the same block, if you've got a hardness tester, and that's another great tool to have, you can go down, pinch the pan rail, get a number on your block. That will help us to give you a starting point. If we've got a block that's 220 Brunel versus a block that's, say, 300, we're going to need to start at a different point as far as our you know, initial stone that we use. Having that information is very important. But within that same block, the back of the block may home completely different than the front of the block. For sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. You may have to go 10 more strokes in the back than you did in the front to uniform and get that finish even around the block, which even if you've got great ring seal, everything's working great, how much are you leaving on the table? How much did you leave not knowing the finishes weren't the same across the And keep in mind, we're not even talking about true straight and round stuff because it might take a totally different approach to get them straight and round before you even worry about what the texture is like. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, especially with liner blocks, you know, we see that a lot in aluminum blocks that have a thin liner. Yes. And, man, those things will move all over the place like silly putty. The next thing you know, you're in there with your probe liner going, this surface finish looks awesome. But it ain't around, right? So that doesn't help me either. Looks you know? like a stop sign. That's that's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like a stop sign. It's, it's about as round as a stop sign. And one of the things that you, you know that we're we're touching on here is just the evolution of how much all of this has changed. Back in the seventies and eighties, when we were dealing with those soft blocks and big rings and molly coated rings, molybdenum is one of the things that has allowed the machinist. And I'm not picking on anybody or any materials to get away with a lot of stuff. Molybdenum is very, very porous. It's up to 40% porosity. It soaks up oil like a sponge. So not only do we have the cylinder that we're trying to get that great finish to get it to hold the oil, we have a material on the ring that's also holding oil. So you could miss this and get away with it because of molybdenum. So that sounds like a great thing. Why did we move away from Bali? coated rings or molly rings? Why did we go to this newer technology? What are the advantages of the new stuff we have? Why not have something that's super forgiving? Well, one of the things we were talking about earlier, I don't know if we were on camera or off camera, <laughs> was, you know, I'm of the age, and, and, and I think the rest of us are here as well, that you're 100,000 miles on an engine. Man, you better have some money saved up because it's time for a new engine. Or if you're like some people, time to trade her in and get another one, right. uh, because it's not going much more than 100,000 miles. And that's the thing. Well, that used to be a big deal. That's right? a like, big deal. I mean, 75,000 miles, putting a timing chain on your small block. Right. So the ring wears faster. It's a soft coating. It is forgiving, but it's a soft coating. The other part is the rings today are much, much thinner. Molybdenum does not stick well to the ring. If you've got a big 560 force ring, it's got a lot of surface area. It's got a lot of adhesion. So we can get into a little detonation. We can put a little boost on it. We can put a little nitrous to it and know that coating is going to stay there. But you do a molly filled one millimeter ring and we rattle it. We get a little out of whack. Pop. There goes the molly. It shoots right off the ring. Right, right off. It's very abrasive stuff. Gets in, you know, once it's loose, it gets into the skirt of the piston, tears the solder off. So the bottom line is adhesion is a problem. 
Nowadays, we're into PVD coatings. We're into hard coating technology. These new hard coatings, whether it be chrome nitride or tungsten carbide carbon or titanium, DLCs, all the trick of the week words, these coatings wear extremely well. It allows us to get 200, 250, 300,000 miles out of these engines as long as, you know, as well as the blocks are harder, the oils are better. But now with that hard coating, all the oil trapping has got to be on the solder wall. The ring has very little ability to hold oil. So it used to be my ring was the sponge that would hold some of that oil. Now that we've gotten away from that, we now have to really focus on the cylinder wall. And it doesn't help that at the same time, now our cylinder walls have gotten harder. So the process to machine it and get that finish got more difficult. And now we can kind of understand why some of these guys have been doing it forever are going, I don't know, it always worked in the past. Why doesn't it work now? It work now. That, and, that, and that's a key part of it. Again, I'll go back to that big thick ring technology. We could miss that bore finish. And anybody out there that has a profilometer, one of the things I say to them all the time is, you know, if you've got an engine that's great, it's really sealed up, it's really dry, it's making great vacuum, it's making great power. When you get that engine in, one of the things you want to do is measure the run bore. Because it, you know, be the engine whisperer. It's listening, it's talking. You know, listen to what it's telling you. It's telling you, that's the finish that I like. Yep. So on the rehone, simply take those numbers, add 10. You gotta start here to end up here. But the, the point of that is the rings have worn that finish to where they're happy. This is what they like. So in today's world with very thin rings, very light oil tensions, hard blocks, slippery oil, again, talking about that ring seating, if we miss this number, Will the rings eventually bring that finish into where they're happy? Sure. That could take 7,000 miles. It could take 500 hits on a dyno. I'm exaggerating, obviously. But they will fix that finish given time. But, you know, that's something no that you touched away. on earlier where we made the comment about how now when we run one of our engines, there's hardly any break-in. Like, we'll assemble the engine, make sure everything's clean. We fire the thing out, the arm it up once or twice, you start making hits. And it's not magic that we got that to happen. I don't want to paint this picture that like we're doing something secret or special that nobody else can do. The reality is we're just measuring now. Use I love the term you used earlier, measuring numbers. And now we have data. So all we've started doing over the last few years is going, well, let's look at what the engine got after it ran and starting with that. So what it means is now we're just that much closer to the break-in period and we can get on with the engine's life and go do what it does. And so I think that was a really good point that you made now we can kind of come full circle and see why that happened and how we got there. It was from measuring those numbers. Now, we've talked a little bit about the texture, the surface finish, and we've talked a little bit about why we need those numbers versus RA. But what about the old discussion about my crosshatch angle? First of all, what the heck is crosshatch angle and why do I care what the angle is? Well, the, the crosshatch angle is, is, we'll have it depicted right back here. We you know it is the cross, it is the X. And when we say the word 45 degree, which is the most common crosshatch angle, that is what is referred to as the included angle. This is the angle between the lower and the upper portion. Most people don't have the tools to measure this. Most, let's say more sophisticated shops are gonna use a USB microscope, go in there, plot it, look at the angle, yeah, I've got 45 degree. The simple way I got you know, get around to it is, I use a flexible plastic protractor. Mm -hmm. I'll take that protractor, lay it in the cylinder, zero line is the deck, I simply measure half of that angle coming down off the deck at 22. So 45 degree would be a 22 and a half degree off of the deck. So when my stone is turning and I'm moving it up and down or my CNC machine's moving it up and down, it's actually moving like in a helical, like a helix type pattern and then it comes down and it comes up and as it goes down and up, it makes that cross hatch. So uh, if I want to measure that, I think total, so you guys have these little credit card based protractors, right? I don't know how good this shows up on camera, but it looks really good on Ed's blue shirt here, right? <laughs> But uh, you can use this, and like you said, you can put it in there and zero it, and then whichever one lines up with that line, that's your half angle. So you double that, and you know, your total cross hatch. But now that we understand what it is, why would I want something? You said 45 is the most common. Why would I want something not common? Well, again, the angles come down to, we're looking at a couple of things. Cross hatch angle helps to determine ring rotation speed. So in any engine outside of, let's say, a two-stroke with a pinned ring, the rings are going to turn. If we get the rings turning too quickly, and especially in an engine that's got a little bit of detonation, excessive fuel in the cylinder, we're, there, there's other elements that can try to help line those rings up. If we get the rings really spinning too quickly, and then we add, let's say, a fluid that's trying to find its way out, it's looking for that path, it's like, hey, there's the exit plan, 
it's going to try to line the rings up. So getting the right rotation speed is very, very important to keep those rings staggered and offset. But it's also what I want to call the dam. As the cross hatch angles flatten out, blow by numbers improve. We're creating a bridge or a dam that's helping to stop blow by from getting down to the pan. So instead of easily traveling up and down, we're now asking it to travel side to side. We're trying to flatten that out to get it to migrate from left to right. But at the same point in time, as that angle starts to go down, we can get into an oil control problem just for the same reason. The oil is not easily directed back to the sump. It's trying to go left and right, not up and down. So we can play with the cross hatch angles. Typically, longer stroke engines, big diesels, Harleys, airplanes, engines where we want to get more oil to the top of the board, we'll increase that angle as much as a 60 degree, including 30 off the deck. Mm -hmm. Higher RPM, short stroke, comp eliminator, pro stock engines of that Small, nature. Little tiny rings. Little tiny rings. We'll flatten that angle down. We've got vacuum pumps. We've got incredibly good board geometry. We can flatten that angle down into possibly into the 20s yeah. where we've got good oil control, the right oil control, but most importantly in that application, we've got no blow by. The other thing that I think you can talk about too is the relationship of fuel type that determines how that valley we talked about earlier. If you're going to have a big giant valley that's going to have a ton of oil there, well, you're probably going to need a way to get rid of it. Does that, does that alter my cross hatch angle? Absolutely. Again, that ease of moving that oil up and down the board, we kind of touched on a little earlier, we were talking before the camera was rolling, about cross hatch angles, and, and we see this a lot in like flat engines, boxer style engines. Mm -hmm. They'll go to a steeper cross hatch angle, 60 degree, simply because it's easier to move that oil back down to the sump. They'll give up a little efficiency in the engine, as far as blow by is concerned, to get that improved oil control. As any of us that ever own these engines know, they're anything but a dry engine. That's sure. just kind of the nature of the beast. Yeah. So they're putting that steeper angle in there to try to make it easier to get that oil back to the sump. So, so if we think of that, that say, oil control ring is squeegeeing that oil off the cylinder wall, the, the more direct that path leads back to the sump, the easier it's going to be to do that, right? But Absolutely. that comes at the cost of extra ring rotation. And, you know, so we're playing the balance between my my cylinder ring sealing and my oil control to find what's the right cross hatch angle for that application. And, and I like the word that you use, Ben, because balance. Everything we're talking about here, whether it be the rings, the block, the cylinder finish, it's all about that balance. It's all yeah. about no. finding that right balance None for of your application. By themselves is the magic it's answer to how you answer. win the race, right? right? Like it all is part of the total system and part of the total package. And so it's not like Man, I used to be a mediocre engine builder, but now I got a propellometer and I'm winning every race I go to. It's just another piece of that puzzle. It's, you know, everything you, this is about is about data. That's you know, right. You know, here we are in 2020, and the big thing between now and back then is we've got data, we've got computers, we have access to tools like propellometers. If propellometers, you know, new? No, they've been around for decades. You just couldn't afford them. Yep. That's the problem. And what you could afford back in the day simply measured RA. And so what we used to measure with emotion, we now measure with data, right? We used to look at, ooh, that's a nice looking solar. That makes me feel good about my machine work. Or, you know, that's a great looking RA finish you got there. But that was emotionally driven. It looked good. It felt good. It seemed good. So when we'd have something not go right, a failure or a ring seal, then it was always this voodoo magic. It must have been something your rings did to me, Keith. You told me the wrong rings, darn it. You know, Redhead right? stepchild. That's right. We're, so, we're back there. <laughs> very subjective. That, yes, very, very subjective, subjective, you know, right. emotional type thing. Yep. Whereas now you can take all of your feelings and all of your emotions and all that subjectivity out and we can measure it with objectivity and make it now black and white. You know, so I ran the engine. I basically started with targets of RK, RPK, RDK. I tested that. And then I made a change and I tested it again. And now I can see what the difference is. But before we couldn't do that because we didn't even know what RPK and RK was or RA, cross hatch angles. So now that we've talked about a bunch of that stuff, and everybody understands how to do it. What I'm wondering Ed, is how do I get that? Yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent question. And and you know the 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 uh, profilometer brings up an excellent subject as we migrate from standard abrasives to diamond abrasives. Okay, you get a customer. And he's been honing like this for 20 years and he's been using standard abrasives and he likes the looks of that finish. Okay. And I can give him the exact same finish and he won't like that. You know, it doesn't look right. You know, it's, there's something different. Well, how do you know that? Well, I can just tell it just, it just looks different. Well, you've got 
grab your profilometer and, and you pull it out and you know data doesn't lie that's right okay it it tells the truth and and the other big thing is is when you're converting from a standard abrasive to a diamond abrasive you can't take a 220 grit standard abrasive and compare it to a 220 grit diamond abrasive totally different finish diamond abrasive is harder particle has less friability doesn't crumble or, or, or splinter. So the diamond abrasive, a 220 grit diamond abrasive is going to give you a much rougher finish than a 220 grit standard abrasive will. So that's the first thing you have to have when we're converting like that. You know, I carry that, if I carry that, uh, that profilometer with me everywhere I set up a new machine. So I keep hearing that profilometer come up over and over again. It sounds like it's almost a tool that we got to have if we want to be serious about this. Uh, I feel it is. I, I, I really do, especially when you're making that conversion from, from standard abrasives to diamonds. Do you get a lot of pushback from people saying, oh, that's just a gimmick. You don't need to buy one of those. And like, sure, because it's, well, we've been doing it this way for 30 years and we've had success. That's right. And, that's and you know, Keith has, has taken the last 10, 15 minutes to explain why that won't work any longer, yeah. you know? Yeah. We've done a great job of that, Keith. You want to add anything before we... We kind of want to just you know, kind of expand and say, you know, like, you know, with Ed and the travels, you know, we're out on the road, we come into people's shops, we're, we're working on this all the time. And we, as people, we get comfortable. We got a system. I like my way of doing it. This yeah. is, this is my way of doing it. I like peanut butter on my toes. Yeah. You know, that, that's what I like. And, and I like Jeff peanut butter. That's, that's the one I've got to have. I want that. And we, we build a system. We build something we know that is what we like. And as we've stated so many times here, Everything has changed. It's all different today. I, how many shops do you walk into it that have got that system taped up on the wall from the 80s or the 90s, and they still follow that absolutely. with religion? Uh, unfortunately, way too many. You know, absolutely. You're, you're right. I would, if I were guessing, I would say 75 to 80% of them are still doing it the old way. You know, the way that they've done it for years and years and years. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you bring up an excellent point is, is on the plateau and, and you're talking about this. I see so many people that will take a 220 grit diamond, hone it to within a thousandths and a half of size, put a 280 in there, hone it another thousandths, then put a 400 in there and hone it another half thousandths. Well, all you've done is, is wipe out the 220 grit, the 280 grit finish, and you have a base finish of a 400 grit diamond, which I'm sorry, of a, a standard abrasive, which has absolutely no RBK in it. Yeah, and that's going to be a problem for that ring, isn't it? And, and that's a problem. We're going to have, we might get good results right off the bat. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go back to a certain, no longer with us, God rest his soul, pro stock engine builder. I mean, he would do all of that, then wrap that head with a little 800 grit, 1,000 grit, yes. put her on the pump. Man, she made great steam. Awesome power. Three hits later, out the window. Yeah. It's done. So that's, you know, you, you can do that, but you're just not going to get the longevity. Yep. I, I know, and I'll, I'll speak to the man standing behind the camera right now. Lake was just at a gentleman's shop. Great customer, been with us forever, uh, and has his system. But as Lake revealed, going in there with that profilometer, He's got no RVK. That's the biggest thing that I think has changed in all of the performance world together, where it's on the engine machining side, the engine building side, or the tuning side, where a lot of things have migrated to, you know, uh, EFI. But even carburetor tuners now, we have data. And so what's being happening is there's this, we're, we're in this sort of uh, period, the last 10 years or so, almost a renaissance of, of engine building, engine tuning in that it's changing everything because we're able to make data driven decisions rather than, you know, subjective, emotionally based. Yeah, but type decisions. Yeah, but I've always done it this way. Yep. I see your numbers. Yeah, but, you know, now what's happening is even guys that were just average, run of the mill, mediocre engine builders before are able to produce really good top level results for their customers because there's no doubt, there's no mystery, there's no magic, and all this voodoo has kind of been pushed to the side. And honestly, I think there's a lot of guys that if they don't get on board, and it's not a rottler or a total sales nope. pitch, right? No, it's no. just the reality of if they don't get on board with measuring and collecting data and then doing something about it, they're just going to get left behind. Okay. Yep. You know, uh, uh, another uh, instance is, is we, we have a good customer, and, and, and you actually uh, turned me on to him, Mike Moran, up in, uh, up in Detroit. And, and Mike is a very accomplished engine builder, uh, doggone good at what he does. 
and 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 he'll just admit that that you know he thought he was an excellent guy to hone cylinder walls and knew what he was doing and and man had her dialed in and we were able to sell him a new home and and come up with a plan for the rvk rk parameters and he noticed he's building this for a customer, he has four or five of these motors that's in his stable, and he kind of, you know, it's just kind of a revolving door. And so he knows exactly how much horsepower they're building. Exactly. Every motor is within, I think he said, three or four horsepower. Well, he noticed once he went to the new diamonds and the R and, and started doing these RBK numbers that he had an increase of 10 to 12 horsepower on the motor. Wow, that's good. And he said, the only thing I can relate that to is this. This new surface finish. Now I've got data. So now I've got data. You, you, you've got data. And, and it's all, you know, it is, let's call it the modern way. Yeah. You know, we're not just going by seat of the pants, the gut feeling. Uh, I had a gentleman the other day, he's had an engine that's had a couple of issues. He's been fighting this over the time period of a couple of years. And and he just said to me, he goes, I just, you know, I just can't afford a day on the dime. I'm like, really? You built the engine, what? You're now on the third build. You've changed all these different things. And yet, what you could learn on that dyno in one day would answer every question you have about why it's doing what it's doing. Back to that collection of that data. That is, it's one of the most important things you can have is to know what it's doing and why it's doing it. Sure. Well, at the end of the day, there's a ton that goes into this stuff, and there's a lot more to the story. And that's what you guys are doing on a daily basis when you talk to people. But for now, we should probably give this part a break and give you guys a chance to ask some questions and stuff. And then we're going to move to the next part of the uh, program where, Ed, you're going to teach us, now that we kind of have an idea of what we want, you're going to help us go over to the machine and figure out how to set it up to get what we want. Is that right? Yes, correct. So why don't you guys ask some questions and we'll get Ed set up to do the next section. What a day, what a day, what a day. My, yeah, my, brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars, we are not going to listen.